This morning, we'd like to draw your attention to the first chapter beginning with verse 1, the first epistle of John. That one which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, our hands have handled of the word of life, for the life was manifested, and we have seen it, and bear witness, and show unto you that eternal life which was with the Father, and was manifested unto us. That which we have seen and heard declare we unto you, that ye may have fellowship with the Father, or with us, and truly our fellowship is with the Father and his Son, Jesus Christ. And these things write we unto you that your joy may be full. So you've got the first one already. This then is the message which we have heard of him and declare unto you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with God and we walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light then we have fellowship one with the other, and the blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, cleanses us from all sin. The first couple of verses I'd like to put together with his introduction to his gospel. As John wrote the gospel, he said, in the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God, and all things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. And then further down, John declared, And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. With that as a background, now he begins his epistle. That one which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, our hands have handled, the word of life. For the life was manifested, and we have seen it, and bear witness and show unto you that eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested unto us. The declaration that Jesus is indeed God manifested in the flesh. Existed from eternity. The creator of all things and yet the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. We saw him, we heard him, we touched him, John is saying. So at this time of year, when we again are thinking about the coming of Jesus Christ into the world, and our attention is being drawn to the fact that the Savior was born in Bethlehem almost 2,000 years ago, and we are remembering the birth of our Lord. The question should naturally arise, why did he come? Why was God manifested in the flesh? What was the purpose of the coming of Jesus Christ into the world? And here John tells to us the purpose. For he declares, that which we saw, that which we heard, we declare unto you that you might have fellowship with us, and truly our fellowship is with the Father and his Son, Jesus Christ. So the purpose of God sending his Son into the world was to make it possible for man to have fellowship with God. 
Now this Greek word koinonia, which is translated fellowship in the text here, is a very broad and complex word. And it almost defies translation into English because we do not have any English word that is an equivalent of this Greek word koinonia. It is a word that has been translated fellowship, common, communion, partaker, because in the word there are shades of all of these meanings. The word has also been translated as a partner or partnership. And as we look at just two of these words, to understand a little bit of that relationship that God wants with you, we realize that this relationship could not be possible unless that one who was from the beginning did not come in the flesh to be manifested unto us. You see, when God first made man, the purpose of God in creating man was that he might have fellowship with man. That was the original purpose of creation. What does it mean to have fellowship with God? Well, let's take first of all the word friend. One of the translations of this Greek word koinonia. A friend is one to whom you can just pour out your soul. You don't have to be guarded in what you say. You can just say anything you want. And you know that because of their love, and friendship, they'll hold the good and discard the bad. You know, you just let it all roll out, the, the chaff with the wheat, and they hold on to the wheat and they blow away the chaff. I know that my relationship can't be destroyed by some stupid thing that I might say. And thus I feel a perfect freedom in just expressing to them my feelings, because I know that they will understand me because they are a friend. With people who are just acquaintances, we have to be guarded. We're afraid that we might say something that would offend them and turn them away. They might not understand us fully, and so you're, you're very protective and guarded in what you say to them. But with a true friend, you can just say anything or you can say nothing. You know, when friendship is deep enough, words really aren't necessary to maintain it. One of the closest friends I have, and I do have many acquaintances, I don't have many friends. Unfortunately, it seems that we just don't develop many friends in life. But one of the closest friends I have, I talk to about once every three or four years. Fortunately, I had the opportunity of talking to him in the last week or so because I needed a favor from him. And so I called him, and just like I knew, you know, it was just like we had been talking every day, we caught up on a little bit of what's happening to his family and what's happening in my family, and he took care of this need that I had for me, and uh, he's just a great friend. And every three or four years, I'll call him or he'll call me, but it's just a bond that exists between us, a real friend.
God wants to be your friend. God wants you to feel a complete freedom in just pouring out your heart to him. You don't have to be guarded when you talk to God. You know, when I am alone with the Lord, I share things with him out of my heart that I have never shared with any human living. I can share things with God, my feelings, my thoughts, that I couldn't share with anybody else. And God wants that kind of a relationship with you. God wants to be so close to you that you can just share your heart with Him at any time, even your doubts, even your angers. As Martha said, Lord, if you'd only been here, my brother would not have died. Good, Martha. You're not afraid to share it with Him. Because you know that he understands and he cares. Even though you're angry at the moment because he was so late in arriving. He's the kind of friend you can just share your heart and it doesn't change the relationship. It's still a close bond. A second thing about friendship is that Oftentimes, as you're seeking to express to them your feelings and the situation that you're facing, you'll find them repeating it back to you much more clearly than what you were expressing it to them. They seem to have grasped the picture and be able to turn it right back and explain it to you so clearly and succinctly that now you see it and understand it better yourself. And so with God. Many times as I try to express myself to Him and I'm sort of fumbling, searching for words, I find that God just clarifies the whole situation and I begin to see it with a new light and a new understanding. And now I begin to understand it more clearly as He sort of relates it back to me, but I now see it in perspective. Friends are like two streams that merge and flow together in a brook. As they flow together for a while, they are so intermingled that they've become a part of each other. That's a good description of this Greek word koinonia. So intertwined, so intermingled that you become a part with each other. So that God becomes a part of you and you become a part of God. Jesus said, in that day you will know that I am in the Father and you are in me and I am in you. This beautiful friendship, fellowship, koinonia. Where I become a part of the eternal God, where he becomes the part of me and our lives flow together and become one, the common, the communion, the oneness that man can experience with God. The experience that God wants man to have with him. The second word our word partner or partnership is also actually the root. Uh, koinonia is an abstract noun. The, the, the noun itself is koinonos, which word means partnership. To be brought into a partnership with God. Now, there are three things I think that are necessary for partnership, and one of them is mutual interest. I must have his interest at mind, and he must have my interest in mind. Now, that I should be interested in God and in the things of God is very understandable. I have no problem with that but that God should be interested in the things of my life that I find very difficult to comprehend. 
as the psalmist said, when I consider the universe that you have created, what is man that you are mindful of him? Who am I that God should be interested in me? Who am I that God should be mindful of me? And yet that's one thing that is involved in partnership, that mutual interest in each other. And let me say that God's interest doesn't end in your life when you leave the sanctuary. His interest in you doesn't end when Sunday is over. But he's interested in you on Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday and when you're living your life in that world out there, his interest is still in you. Nor should our interest in him end when we leave the sanctuary or when Sunday is over. But we should be mindful and interested in the things of God every day of the week. All hours of the day. With a partnership there has to be also a mutual devotion or sharing. So that as I enter into a partnership with God, all of his resources become mine. He places into that partnership all of the resources of knowledge, wisdom, and power. And they now become available to me. But how often am I prone to mess things up in this partnership because I don't draw from the resources that are there. I act on my own counsel without seeking his wisdom. And I can get my life so messed up when I don't take the time to seek the wisdom and the knowledge and the counsel of God. With a partnership, there's mutual activity. As God accommodates himself to my weaknesses, as we sang in that one song, stoop to my weakness, mighty as thou art. Now there is a common concept that we've all had that I feel is wrong. You see, all of us have felt that somehow we're constantly waiting on God. You ever felt that way? Oh, I've waited so long for God. When's he going to work? When's he going to do something? I've been waiting for God so long. And we have this concept that we are constantly waiting on God. You know what the truth really is? God is always waiting on us. There is a word that is used so often concerning God. It is the word long-suffering or patient. And it talks about God and his relationship with us being patient and being long-suffering. What does that mean? It means he's waiting on us. You see, God is wanting to work, but I'm in the way. I don't yet fully understand it. I would botch it up at this point. And so God waits for me, waits for me, waits for me to come into harmony with that which he is purposing and desiring. And then when I finally see it and I come into harmony, then it gives him the opportunity to move and do what he's wanting to do. But he is so patient as he waits on me. He accommodates himself to my weaknesses, to my bumbling. And I think of this, the powerful God who created the universe 
so gentle with me, so patient with me, as he brings to pass those necessary changes in my life in order that he might do the work that he's been wanting to do. I think in my own ministry, how that God waited for 17 years working dumb things out of my life, bringing me to the place where he could finally do the work that he was desiring to do the whole while, but I was in the way keeping him from doing it because of my own fumbling characteristics. The gentleness of God as he deals with me. When you think of gentle, so often in your mind you picture a little stream bubbling over the rocks through the woods. You say, oh, what a gentle little stream. My picture of gentleness is a professional tackle on one of these football teams weighing 275 pounds, standing at six foot seven, walking through the park with a little toddler holding on to his finger. He slows down his gait so that he doesn't run away from that little toddler. And he takes his time. All of that power held in reserve as he accommodates himself to the speed and the strength of that little child. And so with God, his gentleness with me as he slows down and as he waits for me and watches me as I stumble and as I'm making my way along and every once in a while ready to fall and I grip the finger a little harder to balance myself. That mutual activity with God. Now, God wants to be your friend. God wants to be one that you can confide in completely and feel the freedom of just sharing your heart at any time. He wants to be there to counsel and to advise you to put your life in perspective so you can see things as they really are. God desires that you have your shared interest Shared resources, and that always seems rather ludicrous to me as we say, okay, God, I'm going to go into partnership with you. I'll throw in all everything I've got, and you throw in everything you've got, you know. <laughs> you know, the amazing thing is that God was willing to throw in everything, but sometimes I hold back on my part. It's not all available to him. Everything that God has is available to me. But not always do I make everything I have available to him. It's ridiculous, isn't it? And yet God wants a partnership with you. He says, I'll throw it in. All of my resources, they're here. They're available. You can draw on them any time you want. Fellowship. Closeness. Communion. Oneness. That's what God desires with you. But sin marred the beautiful picture. And it caused man to break fellowship with God. So that if I say I have fellowship with God and I'm walking in darkness, I'm telling a lie. I'm not speaking the truth. For sin alienates a man from God. You cannot be one with the holy, righteous God and be filled with darkness, sin, impurity. It's incongruous. It's an impossibility. 
Light and darkness cannot commingle. They are mutually exclusive. And so if I say I have this commonness or communion or fellowship with God and I'm walking in darkness, I'm only deceiving myself. I'm lying. I'm not telling the truth. For sin always has as its sad byproduct or side effect the alienation of that person's life from God. Now, Jesus came into the world to restore fellowship with God so that you could come back into fellowship with God. So how does he affect that by taking our sin and dying in our place. So when we think of the coming of Jesus Christ and we see the nativity scenes and we see the mother hovering over the child and the shepherds kneeling there adoring and we think, oh, isn't it glorious Christ came into the world. Joy to the world. The Lord is come. And then we would ask, why did he come? We suddenly see that behind that manger there is the cross. And it is casting the shadow over this beautiful scene of the mother and child. For he came to restore man into fellowship with God. But in order that this fellowship be restored, something had to be done with the sin which had broken that fellowship. And so God laid on him the iniquities of us all. He died in our place taking our sins that he might restore man to this possibility of being one with God. So now if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with the other as his blood is cleansing us from all sin. You see, that's a, that's a necessity. There has to be that cleansing of sin if there is to be fellowship. You cannot be walking in darkness and be one with God. It's impossible. But through the blood of Jesus Christ continually cleansing us of our sins, we then have this fellowship with God, this life as God intended it to be. I look at the world in which we live. I see the things that are happening. I read the reports in the papers of, of the horrible things that are happening in this world in which we live. And I say, surely that is not the way God intended man to live. I read of the suffering in the world. I read of the wars. I read of the crime. I read of all of these horrible atrocities. And I say, that isn't the way God intended man to live, and truly it isn't. God did not intend that man's lives should be mastered by sin and by greed. God intended that man should live in oneness with him, in fellowship with him. But sin had broken that fellowship, but now the way is made for man to be restored as one with God. And all you have to do is receive Jesus Christ. His death as a substitute for you. And he will wash you and cleanse you from that which keeps you from being one with him. Now, to celebrate the coming of the Lord into the world and yet not to be in fellowship with him is really rather ridiculous, isn't it?
Only those who know fellowship with God can legitimately celebrate. Unto us is born this day in the city of David a Savior, Christ the Lord. And you really don't know what Christmas is all about until you have fellowship with God. And then you realize the real reason for Christmas. Shall we pray? Father, as we've come into this season of the year when again men are reminded of the birth of the Savior, we thank you, Jesus, for coming. To make possible our coming into fellowship with God. Becoming a partner, a friend, one with him. Now, Lord, help us, we pray to walk in this friendship and partnership. In Jesus' name, amen. The scripture says that Enoch walked with God. Wonderful. But what is even more marvelous to me is that God walked with Enoch. That God will walk with me in union, in fellowship, in communion. And I pray that you might come to know the full fellowship as you experience more and more that relationship that God desires to bring you into, that full relationship until your lives are so merged that you become a part of each other's. You and him, he and you, enjoying the oneness with the Creator. If you don't know this fellowship, I would encourage you to go back to the prayer room this morning and there, ask the Lord to forgive you your sins through Jesus Christ and make you one with him. You can't believe the difference it'll make in your life, and you can't believe the difference it'll make in your Christmas. To know the Savior who was born. May the Lord be with you and bless you and give you a beautiful week. And may your fellowship in him just increase and grow as we approach this day that man has set aside to celebrate the coming of the Savior into the world. And may the peace that only Jesus can give fill your heart, your mind, your life with the joy of fellowship with God.